Hi everyone, welcome to the solid waste lecture. So let's spend some time talking about trash. Well, it's more than just trash. Solid waste actually um, encompasses sort of a, a few different things here. So we're going to talk about um, municipal solid waste, which is what we're considering all the stuff that's thrown out by households and businesses and offices and those types of things. Um, so we're going to talk through the waste stream. We're going to also talk about how we can reduce solid waste, so how we can make the waste stream smaller. And then we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about hazardous waste. So there's a, a certain delineation or, or difference here between uh, solid waste and hazardous waste. All right, so let's get solid. Excuse me. <laughs> let's get started. Um, if you didn't know, and you probably should, and I bet you could guess if I quizzed you on this, here in the United States, we generate more solid waste per capita than any other country. Per capita simply means per person. So if you took the amount of trash that we produce on a daily basis and you divided it up by the number of people in this country, it would be a little over two kilograms uh, of trash per day. And that's more than anybody else. Canada is a second close to us, um, but we are a relatively kind of trashy nation, if you think of it that way. Only in the sense that the amount of trash that we actually produce. Um, what happens, and what one of the big differences is, is even though we don't have one of the largest populations, right, uh, China and India have us... Um, um, well beaten in that category when it comes to uh, population size, but because of our affluence, because of as a nation um, that has a lot of uh, affluence, meaning we are able to buy a lot of stuff, and uh, because we have disposable income, because we have that ability, we typically tend to just throw away and buy new rather than taking things that we could repair or reuse or recycle like they would in other places. So we might have um, phones that uh, we replace um, on a yearly or almost yearly basis because we might want the latest and greatest features that a, that a phone can have. Is there anything wrong with our old phones? Uh, probably not necessarily. They're probably just fine. But because we have the ability to buy new, we do. We could say the same things about a lot of things, not just phones, but we could talk about clothes, we could talk about shoes, we could talk about all kinds of items. So in any case, there's a, a definite correlation, a definite relationship between um, the, the amount of money a nation has, what we call that, again, that affluence, and how much waste that they create. Uh, so here's just a, a nice image showing us um, one of those things that we are prone to do as Americans is buy things uh, like bottled water. Um, bottled water is something that we can get out of the tap and it's something that is um, that we sort of have turned into a commodity here, especially in the United States, putting it in a bottle and, and charging people a dollar or three dollars for a bottle of water. Uh, it's a sort of a uniquely American ID, uh, idea, charging for something that you can get for pennies on the dollar just by getting water from your own tap. All right, so let's talk about types of waste. What we're primarily going to focus on is what we refer to as municipal solid waste. So this is residential and commercial waste that's produced in a municipal area. So a city, a town, a village, whatever it happens to be. This is actually a very small part of the waste stream. It's only 2%, but this is everything that is thrown out by, again, homes and offices and stores and restaurants and libraries and schools and any other commercial or institutional facility. So that's what makes up municipal solid waste. It includes um, all kinds of different uh, things like paper and paperboard and plastics and food wastes. And I'll show you a little graphic in a minute that has all of that. Everything else, the other 98% <laughs> is called non-municipal solid waste. And this is generated by industries. So industries would be your manufacturers, uh, agriculture, and mining. So here's our nice little uh, pie charts here that are showing us exactly what we're generating and what waste is being created. So by far and away, the mining industry uh, would be the most wasteful industry there is. Uh, wasteful in the sense that for the small amount of material they're recovering, 
whatever that material happens to be, whether it is coal, whether it is a precious metal, whatever it happens to be, they generate an awful lot of, of waste, typically in the form of rock uh, that they have to get through just to get that small resource. So uh, agriculture also produces a large amount of waste. So you can sort of think of um, all the, the leftover uh, plant parts that we're not using. So the, the corn stalks to so think of um, a field of corn. All they need are the ears of corn and what's left over are all those stalks and, and the, the stalks, the plants that the corn ears of corn grew on, um, it can make up a, a fairly significant amount of waste at the end of the season. Uh, and again, industry here, manufacturing, but let's take a little look at this municipal solid waste here. Here's what's in the waste that we throw away on a daily basis. Most of what we throw away is paper and paperboard, um, followed closely by the next three categories, yard waste, food waste, and plastics. And then you have, again, metals, uh, textiles, wood, glass, and this other category, if you will. All right, so we generate all of this waste. What do we do with it? Previously, we used to just use open dumps. Open dumps were essentially a pit that was typically dug in the ground and you would just go to the pit and you would throw whatever you wanted in there and it wasn't regulated anyway and nothing was covered up it was very unsanitary it was smelly you would get lots of rats and flies and disease causing animals uh, some developing countries still use an open dump method most developed countries, or I should say all developed countries, use sanitary landfills now. So sanitary landfills is when we take waste and we compact it, we squish it down, and then we bury it. We can also burn our waste. It's not quite as um, uh, popular here in the United States, but lots of European countries, uh, or especially island nations, places that have don't have a lot of land to devote to a landfill, they will use incineration because it reduces the total volume of waste by up to 90%. And then there are also some things that we can compost, which composting is just turning in yard, scra uh, yard waste and food scraps uh, and actually putting them into a, a pile and letting uh, heat and bacteria work together to break all of that down into some um, components, sort of that, that, that carbon, part of that carbon cycle actually, as we talked about before. So again, you can see what we do with our waste. Most of it is discarded in a sanitary landfill. About a third of it we recycle and the rest is incinerated. So again, incineration isn't as big here in the United States as it is other places. Um, so I'm gonna kind of quickly Glance over what a sanitary landfill is. I'll show you a picture of what a sanitary landfill is. Um, what you have is, once again, you have a pit in the ground, but in this case, this, this pit has a layer of clay and plastic liners to protect the groundwater from uh, rain that percolates down through the waste and picks up hazardous materials. And then you have uh, layers of gravel, which help for, again, the percolation of water. And then what you do is you put in uh, your waste. So here's your, your waste that goes in, that's sort of these gray squares here. And you cover it up with uh, layers of uh, soil. And so we unload the trash, we compact it and push it, we cover it up with waste, and we do that layer after layer after layer until we run out of room. And at that point, we've reached landfill capacity. So um, let's talk a little bit about the problem with plastics. So of the things that we talk about in our waste stream, the paper and the paper board and the wood and the food and the textile scraps, all of those things eventually over time can decompose. It might take a little bit of time, but over time they will decompose and the volume of space they take up will become smaller and smaller. Plastics don't do that. <laughs> Plastics are chemically stable, which means that they can sit in that landfill for thousands of thousands of years and they'll never change. So because of the increasing amount of plastic we have in our waste, we have a, a problem with what to do all of this plastic. Um, there are other types of plastics, so we are playing around with both photodegradable and biodegradable types of plastics. Photodegradable means if you put it in the light, it will break apart, but again, you bury trash, so that's not going to work. And biodegradable sounds like a great idea where microorganisms can go to work and break it down, but it still doesn't work in landfills. You don't have the right conditions. Um, so 
we'll talk about some things that we can do with, with plastics uh, in just a moment. Um, let's quickly talk about incineration. Again, you can burn it, you reduce the volume. There's some things that you have to take out like glass and food waste, but it's really good for paper, plastics, and rubber. You can use the heat to warm a building. You can use it to generate electricity, but there's downsides, particularly uh, pollutants, particulates, depending on what you're burning, there could be heavy metals and toxic materials. And it also produces ash, which has to be disposed of in a hazardous waste facility. So again, for some countries, this is really their only alternative because once again, they don't have the room to devote to a landfill. Uh, but here in the United States, it's not as popular. So this is just showing you a mound of tires. What could we potentially do with those tires? We could burn those tires, but again, you run into some air pollution control problems. So this is what a large scale uh, incinerator would look like. So uh, again, the waste goes into the furnace, you collect the ash, you can create some energy. Uh, composting, I'm gonna kind of pass over composting. Uh, again, it's something that's not typically done on a large scale as far as city programs go, but you can do it personally yourself. You can have a, a backyard composting machine. You can just even have just a composting pile where you just pile all of this stuff up. And again, uh, bacteria will go to work and break it all down into a, a nice organic layer that's actually really good for growing plants. So with all of this waste and all of the ways that we deal with waste, one of the easiest things to do to deal with our waste problem would just be to reduce waste. Um, we call it waste prevention. And so if we don't generate the waste to begin with, then we don't even really have a problem anymore. So um, when it comes to the three R's, right, we all remember reduce, reuse, recycle. So hopefully the, the three R's have been ingrained into us. Reduction is really the key point here, because if we don't generate waste to begin with, then we don't have to deal with the waste afterwards. So less packaging, buying more items that can be used long term, uh, investing more in high quality items versus cheap disposable things. That's the idea. If you can't reduce the waste stream, Reusing would be the next best alternative. So is there something else we can turn it into? And then after that, if we can't reduce and we can't reuse, then we should recycle. Um, so once again, source reduction just talks about making products more durable, making packaging smaller or eliminating packages if we possibly can. Reusing products, once again, is um, if we can take an item and then use it for the same purpose. So. Um, Bottles, for example. Uh, so if there are some companies, um, for example, like Oberweiss. Oberweiss is a company that will actually deliver bottles to you of milk if you want. And they have a delivery system or you can buy Oberweiss glass bottles uh, at your local grocery store. They want you to return the bottles because when you return those bottles to them, they can reuse them. They sterilize them, they clean them, they fill them with milk again, and then they send them back out to customers. So that system works very well because they can greatly reduce the cost of packaging their product if you just keep reusing those glass bottles over and over again. Then the next alternative is recycling. And recycling is when we take materials, we collect them, and we process them into a new product. So we're not using virgin natural resources anymore. We're using existing products. So recycling paper, for example, it saves trees, water, and energy, and also landfill space. Um, Un we're again recycling about 32% of our waste right now. Um, we recycle about 55% of our paper and paperboard. Um, Denmark, by the way, recycles 97%, so we're okay, but we're certainly not as great as some places in Europe. Uh, glass is about 30%, and again, it costs a lot less than making um, virgin glass. And then, of course, um, Cans, aluminum cans. This is probably like the best recycling story. At one time, they would actually pay you to turn in aluminum cans. I don't know if they still offer that. Um, you might be able to go to recycling centers and still get a little bit of money for aluminum cans. But aluminum cans are one of those um, interesting stories in that, oops, I'm sorry, I went up too fast. 
previous. Here we go. Aluminum cans are one of those interesting stories because it takes so much less energy to recycle aluminum and make cans from the recycled aluminum than it does to mine bauxite ore. So bauxite is what we make aluminum out of. Um, mining bauxite and turning it into aluminum is an extremely expensive and energy intensive process. So aluminum cans are great because when we toss those into recycling, they can again be repurposed several times over in order to make cans that are widely and easily available. So um, can companies love recycled cans because it saves them so much money. Plastic is kind of an interesting story because there are so many different types of plastics. Plastic bottles, plastic containers, plastic that we use for packaging. Um, we can use some plastics to turn into the same plastic product. So um, plastic bottles can be used to make new plastic bottles, for example. But other things are a little harder to recycle. Uh, sometimes milk jugs, for example, we can take plastic milk jugs and we can turn them into other things like carpet, uh, we can turn them into felt, we can turn them into maybe some polyester cloth. It all depends on the type of plastics we have. Remember, plastics are sort of numbered one through seven, uh, and some of them can be recycled into products fairly easily, and some of them cannot. Uh, so that's why we have sort of um, this plastic problem is that some things, again, are easy to use and some things are not. Um, I'm not going to talk about tires, but we can recycle tires. So this is sort of a nice graphic which shows you um, the amount of this product that's being recycled versus the amount that's being disposed of in a landfill. So these are all the different items that are in our waste stream and the different bars corresponds to, to different years. So you can see that there's somewhat of a trend in some things for recycling more and throwing away less. Other things have, have pretty much stayed steady. We still throw away more of these things than we recycle. Um, even in the case of aluminum, where there's a huge market for recycled aluminum, we're still throwing it away more than we should. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about integrated waste management, um, but an integrated waste management is, is just like any of these sort of sustainable ideas we've talked about. So um, looking at sustainable water use, remember when we talked about that, you can kind of think of integrated waste management as the same concept of sustainability. So how can we deal with our waste in the best way? How can we use uh, waste minimization and waste prevention? How can we deal with the waste that we have and try to um, recycle what's ever possible and how can we minimize the amount of space that we're using for storage. So that's what integrated waste management is. Uh, very briefly I'm going to talk about hazardous waste is the last thing that we're going to talk about. It's only one percent of the solid waste stream in the United States but it's toxic because these are things that threaten our health or the health of the environment. So things that can react, ignite, uh, explode, cause fires, corrode. We've got all kinds of solids, liquids, and gases that fall into this category. About 700,000 different chemicals in, in what we're tracking is hazardous wastes. Um, unfortunately, we have a sort of a history of not dealing with hazardous waste very well. Um, we have instances where we have companies who would just dump their toxic waste wherever they wanted to dump it. There was no procedures or policies in place to clean toxic waste up um, 40 to 50 years ago. So they would just cover it up and um, that would be the end of the story. But then we know that that toxic, toxic waste doesn't stay there. It leaks into people's drinking water. Um, it contaminates the ground. It has a whole host of potential um, health consequences. Instances like this, like the Love Canal disaster, which you can read about, uh, led to the creation of the Superfund Act. So the Superfund Act, uh, which I'll talk about actually in just a minute, I guess I, I skipped over that. So again, we talked about different types of hazardous waste. There's a group of things called dioxins. We have PCBs. Again, I'm kind of going through this quickly because you can all read through these um, if you want. But what we're doing now is we've created the CERCLA. Um, and then again, CERCLA is, is also known as Superfund. It's the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. What that all means is that the government set up a procedure for cleaning up abandoned and inactive hazardous waste sites. So companies that produced toxic waste, stored the waste on site, and then 
couldn't afford to clean it up because they went bankrupt or for whatever reason, they become Superfund sites. And Superfund sites are sites where we're spending money to clean up these places. So it could include um, large tanks that have been slowly leaking materials into the ground. It can include abandoned barrels where um, toxins have sort of corroded the barrels and it's leaked out. They're very, very expensive to clean up uh, on the orders of billions and billions of dollars every year we spend to clean up these Superfund sites. Um, right now, the, the general policy is what we call polluter pays. So if you have a company that is found that is directly dumping toxic chemicals or not storing them properly, the government can find them and say, you need to pay for the cleanup. But again, what do you do with companies that have been out of business for 20, 30 years? Uh, let's see, so we're going to skip over that. Uh, what can we do with hazardous waste? So we clean it up, and as long as we're not dumping it on site, what do we do with it? Well, we have specific landfills and sites called hazardous waste landfills, and these are places that are uh, sanitary landfills on steroids, for example. So we have lots and lots of uh, protections in place to make sure that these things stay where they're supposed to stay. So depending on the waste, we would store them in barrels rather than just dumping them into the ground. We have lots and lots of liners, concrete liners that are sort of lining the pit here, making sure that nothing can leak out. Once again, we're collecting the leachate. The leachate is just water that percolates down through here. We cap hazardous waste landfills with lots of layers, okay, in order to keep everything in place. That's the idea.